We're ready. All right. Welcome to the eighth webinar in our IGNIS series. And as a reminder, IGNIS is the Latin word for spark or ignite. And that's exactly what we'd like to do here today is to ignite your curiosity about our Washington faculty learning communities. And today we have presentations on learning communities and service learning. And this series is brought to you by SBCTC eLearning and ATL. My name is Alyssa Sells, and I am the eLearning Program Administrator at the State Board. My counterpart is Jennifer Wetham, and she is the Program Administrator for Faculty Development at the State Board. And you may have heard of us referred to as the dynamic duo or the Wonder Twins. We're kind of two sides of the same coin, focusing on faculty professional development. Also joining us today is our Collaborate Rep. Amber Gulart, so let's give her a, a shout out and some applause. Yay. Yay. And she has been so nice to come and help us moderate these sessions, and um, we're just so happy to have her here with us. We're also excited to offer this webinar series to you, and we have a great lineup of presenters for you today, and Jennifer will be introducing them shortly. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our presenters for sharing their FLC experience and knowledge with us today, and also to um, all of our participants for um, either attending and or coming in later and watching this session. So this session will be recorded, and if you miss parts of it today or want to have a friend watch it, you can certainly access those recordings, and I'm going to paste that into our chat right now. Uh, you can access those on um, the ATL blog, and um, that's the main link to the blog, and this is the link to, um, I think it's the IGNIS schedule page, so you can go straight there if you don't want to search for IGNIS on the blog. And then um, if you do want to see the rest of the schedule for the year, you can go straight to that here, and it will um, give you the information about the remaining FLC presentations for this year. All right, so um, let's get a move on here and get through our slides. If you haven't already done so and you'd like to use your audio today, please go ahead and run your audio setup wizard. And you can do that by clicking on the tools menu and then clicking on the wizard and it will walk you through the rest of it. You will not be able to hear the presentation while you're doing that. Um, but if you do plan to use your mic, please go ahead and do that now. All right, here's um, just a quick slide about our meeting interface. We have a whiteboard. That's where you're seeing the slides advance now. We have some whiteboard tools, that skinny little strip in the middle. We're going to be using those in just a second. In the upper left um, corner, we have our audio video panel, and that's where you see my smiling face right now, and you'll see webcams for our presenters who are using them today. Uh, that center block there is the participants panel, and that's where you can see who is in the webinar with us. And the bottom is our chat panel, and I'll talk more about that in just one sec. All right, so these are our participant tools. We've got some emoticons that we can use, that little smiley face there. And I'm going to go ahead and give a smiley face. You'll see there's a smiley face under my name now. Um, there's a tool for stepping away. You can click on that, and it will show you as away from the meeting. You can raise your hand when you want to talk, and it will put you in a numbered order to speak, and we'll call on you. There's also a polling tool there that currently has a check mark on it. I'm actually going to change ours to um, the ABC version here, just one second, because we are going to do a poll in just one second. So um, if you look at our polling tool in our actual panel right now, it's changed to the letter A, and we'll come back to that in a second. That little blue microphone indicates that your mic is on. So if that's on, we can hear you. We can hear anything on your end, typing, phones ringing, whatever. So if you're not speaking, please um, go ahead and click that off. And then the other permissions there show anything else that you may have access to. All right, so here is our chat. Here at the bottom um, left of the panel, you can type in any information. Um, like if you have a comment while the speaker is speaking, go ahead and type that in there. Or if you have a question for one of the moderators, that's a great place um, to put that as well. And there's a separate moderators chat. So if you want to communicate with just the moderators but don't want to ask a question um, to the whole group, uh, the moderators would be using that. OK, next slide, whiteboard tools. 
Okay, there's a blow-up version on the left side here of our whiteboard tools, and I want you to go to your actual whiteboard tools. You'll find that next to the participants panel, and I would like you to find the sun icon and hover over that and um, click it and select a pointer tool for yourself. We are going to use this in just one second for our next activity on the next slide. So if you want to practice here, please feel free. I selected a smiley face, and I see someone else grabbed the sun. So um, we're going to use this here in just one second. So go ahead and practice. All right, looks like you guys have the hang of it. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. This is a map of Washington, and this is something Jennifer and I do each session because we are curious where you guys are at. So taking your pointing tool, find yourself on the map, and give us a shout out as to where you are. I'm in Everett in Snohomish County, so my smiley face goes there. If you're down, um, not in Washington, you can click um, down below, and then if you want to tell us where you're at, please feel free to type that into the chat. All right, looks like everybody's participating. That's great. It's great to see where everyone is joining us from today. And we're going to move on to a quick poll now. All right, so we're going to use that polling tool I showed you just a minute ago, and we're curious as to who you are. Are you full-time faculty, part-time faculty, an administrator, staff, or other, maybe a CBO partner, a librarian? I'm going to go ahead and click on C for administrator because that's my title. And you'll see that um, the letters have appeared next to your name in um, the participants panel. And then I will publish that so you all can see the results. Give me just one second to find it. Okay, there we go. Okay, and there's our responses. So we are joined um, by several people, looks like, today. All right, so moving on. Um, this is just a little bit of meeting etiquette just to keep us uh, rolling smoothly through our presentations. Um, I mentioned the talk button and the raising your hand earlier. So if you would like to speak, please feel free to um, raise your hand and use the little icon um, in the participants panel to do so. And we will call on you in a timely manner. And for us to hear you, you need to make sure that your talk button is pressed. And you'll know that that's turned on when you have the little blue microphone next to your name. And when you're not speaking, remember to turn that off. Again, use those emoticons to indicate approval or a job well done. And then remember to type your questions into the chat as we go. And then we'll come back and revisit them during the Q&A session at the end. We are operating on a loose Ignite format today where we're just going to let our presenters present. We're not going to interrupt them. And then we will come back and answer questions and talk about their presentations at the end. Okay, well, I think I did enough speed talking to get th us through all that. I'm going to turn it over to Jen now and let her introduce our topics and our presenters. Take it Thanks, away, Thanks, Alyssa. That was lovely. And it is fun um, just to go through the wonders of Collaborate. So um, I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking about a faculty, what a faculty learning community is. And our grants are loosely based on the Miami FLC model. So a group of transdisciplinary faculty, students, and staff, um, they develop a collaborative year-long program of professional learning um, about learning about learning. It's very metacognitive. Um, OK, so evidence shows that FLCs increase faculty interest in teaching and learning. And I think this is, especially with our topics today about service learning and OER, they provide safety and support for faculty to investigate, to attempt, to practice assessing certain new technologies or new instructional methods, and they also allow us to adopt new methods with safety. And I think I, ac I accidentally um, missed a slide that the kind of work you might do in an FLC, for example, you might select a focus course or a project to try out innovations, to assess um, if the, what the student learning looks like. Um, you know, if it happened at all, which it generally does, um, or, you know, even just to prepare a course or a mini portfolio to show the results. And today, um, you will be looking at an FLC that 
selected certain focus courses to try out open educational resources. So I think it's it's wonderful. We're we're very lucky to have our presenters today. Um, and a cohort-based FLC addresses the teaching, learning, and developmental needs of an important cohort of faculty or staff. Typically, if they've been isolated, fragmented, stressed, neglected, or just um, frozen, <laughs> frozen out by the academy. A topic-based FLC addresses a special campus um, or divisional teaching and learning need. And both of the cohorts, or both of the, sorry, both of the FLCs today are more topic-based. They're looking at um, open educational resources and service learning, which do require a great deal of institutional navigation to implement. And so an FLC can be a really great way to do that work. So without that, without, without further ado, I will we'll start with service learning at Columbia Basin Community College. And Jerry Lewis will be the FLC coordinator and facilitator, will be presenting. OK. <clears throat> you should put, my, put the timer on. Should I put the timer on? Let's see. I'll do it. Timer. Start timer. There we go, because, you know, even though I think it's going to take me less than 10 minutes, you know, I have a tendency to ramble on. So service learning at uh, CBC, and uh, let me of course, uh, now I'm not quite ready, but OK, here we go. So what is service learning? We um, we started out by ordering three books uh, to read about service learning, and um, and uh, we 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 liked this one in particular, Kay's book, and we liked the definition. Uh, so Kay defines service learning as a research-based teaching method where guided or classroom learning is applied through action that addresses a tenant community need in a process that allows for, and we would replace youth initiative with something else or just initiative because, you know, again, we're talking with about young adults here at the college mostly, but and provides structured time for reflection on the service experience and demonstration of acquired skills and knowledge. So we like that and um, with emphasis on reflection because that's a key component. I mean, it's, I mean, service learning in terms of helping out and doing things is great. But uh, but part of what what we're interested in is the reflection and the the the, uh, the growing from that. Okay. So what were our objectives? Our object objectives objectives were to find and um, create multiple uh, examples of discipline relevant service learning assignments and activities. Have a collo colloquium for staff and faculty. Uh, de develop a guide to service learning, which will capture our key FLC findings and discussions, um, to do a faculty survey and a staff, uh, or student survey, faculty staff survey of service, service learning, uh, sorry, uh, faculty staff service survey of service learning, so knowledge and if, if they're interested in participating, um, and if they're interested in uh, including activities in their classes. And then a student survey, again, willingness and interest in participation. And then a resources web page, which would include curricula, PowerPoint slides, faculty staff guide, and key presentations. So some of this is covered, a couple of these are covered by the web, web page. So I mean, the, the find, we'd be putting the multiple examples on the web page, and the faculty and staff guide would be on the web page. So how did this begin? Well, um, Jason Schlegel, who was um, our BAS uh, director, I think, uh, and uh, also he ran our FYI program, our first year introduction program, proposed this FLC with participation from faculty and staff, which I think caught the eye of the uh, uh, 
FLC people there, and they thought that was a good idea to have, you know, have uh, kind of a collaborative group. And um, so that was, so the origin of the idea, also, J Jason also has been involved with the uh, veterans, um, the veterans department here. So, and actually that's what he is now. He's the, the director of the veterans department. I don't know exactly what it's called. And, you know, I mean, service learning is very, I mean, service, service obviously is a very important thing with veterans, and so that's partially how this, this idea came about. So there was a lot of interest uh, from both faculty administrators, and we were awarded the grant. Yay! So initial steps, we took uh, doodle polls to determine meeting times, and doodle polls to determine more meeting times, and doodle polls. And, so we started having sessions approximately every two weeks. The initial interest was high. We had groups of 12 and 14 with a core group and others dropping in and sort of changed, the faces changed a little bit each week because, you know, we ended up having the meetings at different times. So, you know, some some of the meetings were, were good for us, some people and bad for others. And, and, um, and, um, uh, and so, so we did get different people at different times, which is interesting. We'll talk a little bit about that more later. We did, for the first few meetings, we did have food, cookies and fruit, and then we moved on to pizzas. Uh, curiously, the uh, attendance did seem to drop off when we stopped having food. It dropped off actually a little before we stopped having food, but it really dropped off once we, once we stopped having food. So that might be a lesson learned. <laughs> have food. We did, we did use Collaborate for remote participate, participants and recording. So we recorded all of the sessions, although maybe there was a couple, one or two, where we forgot to turn it on right away. And, um, and uh, we didn't have a lot of participation with the Collaborate. We did have a few people dropping in. And, excuse me, and, uh, um, you know, one one day I had to uh, to participate via collaborate. I was actually on a tour with my son of uh, the the Pacific Northwest Laboratory's uh, computer supercomputer, and I was like participating with my little uh, uh, Samsung Galaxy S3. It was it was pretty painful, but I did I was able to participate. And then one time Monica participated that way. I made a few other people come in. All right. So what did we do? We ordered the books, and they kind of trickled in over a period. Sort of, so we got off to kind of a slow start. So, um, so that's another lesson learned: is, is you know the the more you could do beforehand, the the, the quicker start you get off to. Um, we began to read and discuss the books. Although I did have one teacher who said to me, "Why do we have to read all these books?" So. Um, I think we probably did end up not reading most of the books, although we did what we did do is have um, some people who had read sections report on those sections. Uh, we did discuss the student interest and, and the student survey, which I think I think I have a little picture of later on. Um, we, we talked about the benefits of, of service learning. We talked about relation to student outcomes, which is kind of important, you know, it's kind of what we're about. And um, and then related organizations, so organizations that that uh, we might be able to cooperate with. Oh man, I only have two and a half minutes left, and I'm talking even really quick. Okay, so um, the student survey had about eight, 180 respondents. There was interest in student learning, service learning, and and there was participation in service learning among among the uh, among the students. So. There's interest there, and uh, and the students uh, are actually even doing service learning. Uh, over the course, we did have uh, faculty come in, and, and they talked about their area. And so again, this was an interesting thing where we had, you know, some some of them came in specifically to talk about their area, and some of them came in because they were interested, and then they talked about their area. So ESL. Uh, Cheryl Klim talked about uh, how they always have volunteers working with ESL, and they could use, you know, use students for student learning, student uh, service learning for that. Um, Anthony Ublor, um 
I spelled that wrong. Oh well. Um, has uh, used to teach business writing, and and all of his classes um, they did they did service learning in it, and um, so this, they'd have to find a small business, help them develop uh, uh, develop a project, and then carry through on it. And so that was a, he had he had that every quarter, and and uh, it was incorporated in in that and do it with groups and things. Uh, Monica Hansen, who did this presentation um, with me at the uh, Teaching Learning Conference, uh, worked uh, with local schools to develop out outdoor museum and gathering places. Um, she 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 taught uh, educators or paraeducators or something, and uh, and. Uh, and so one of the things she was saying is that the the benefits is um, in um, apply applied context. So you can have a cooler understanding of what it is to transfer that learning into practice. And so she would she would get her her educators out in the schools to actually do th do that. And then we had um, Gene Holland who does business and marketing here and. His his whole program is pretty heavily service learning oriented. They they find businesses or businesses come to them and they design um, and they design stuff for them. They design whole marketing package packages and the students work with the business uh, or or nonprofit to create marketing materials and collateral materials. And this is basically what he's been doing. So and and. You know, his point was it's best with strong faculty involvement. You can't just teach and go home. You got to you got to be involved in it. So advantages and benefits: um, enhance student learning and development, promote community, build networks, provide work experience, provide democratic and social values, empathy. Looks like we should have had a couple more bullet points there. Um, some of the topics of discussion were how do we give credit for service. So we looked at credentials and badges and certificates, and discussed whether we would need to get get a system or just build something ourselves. We talked about how do we help faculty. Uh, you know, the, the 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 we only had we actually had more administrators on this than faculty administrators and staff. You know, the faculty did kind of come and go, uh, but uh, talked about getting institutional support, having examples, templates. Guest speakers and workshops. Some of the difficulties we had: um, time for faculty uh, to search for opportunities and structure them for success. So you know, I mean, it it does require some some work, and that's part of the reason we we, we our goal is to have some templates and things so that to make it a little smoother and, and perhaps have. Somebody helping uh, to we have uh, somebody volunteer to help kind of coordinate uh, finding the service projects. Um, so and you know some I mean some some uh, misconceptions of purpose in relation to instructional objectives. So um, you know I mean it's not necessarily wrong to have service for service's sake, but uh, but you know. In a lot of cases, we'd probably want to have that tied in with our instructional objectives. Um, and then again, one of the problems is integrating programs and having inter interdisciplinary work across campus. And can we see the larger picture? So um, we reviewed the results of the student survey when we created the faculty survey. We created a short survey, and uh, we are we are close to posting it. So it's. Still in, in progress. So the, to disseminate the information, we uh, have a website, a uh, Google site. Uh, we are working on a teaching and learning day workshop. Um, we, we're going to have somebody come in, but I don't think we're going to be able to get them in with the, the kind of tight scheduling at the end of the quarter. So I'm going to suggest that we do um, do sort of a little workshop where we give this presentation and then have people talk about it and. And share their ideas and uh, maybe do do a little uh, uh, few exercises. Is that everything? And do an in-service presentation next year, next school year. Um, so we had challenge somehow had trouble uh, 
building the web page. Uh, it's still kind of in construction. And uh, we do have the rec collaborate recordings, and we were kind of taking minutes, but uh, but so that was that was a challenge. Finding time for everyone to meet was a big challenge. Uh, you know, when we we were kind of bouncing around from day to day, and then people said, "Well, it's too hard because it bounces around." So we said for the la this last quarter, we said at the same time, same day, and nobody came. So uh, anyway, I guess uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Um, building momentum and turning it into action. So I, so I think you know what we'd like to do is is get get the examples together, get people excited about it, and get a few more people doing it. And there's the books that we looked at. Okay, and so I went way over ten minutes. <laughs> Jerry, that's totally fine. We we have two. We only have two people presenting today um, because Clark's um, other FLC on learning communities had um, had something come up, and so they were unable to present today. So we've got plenty of time, and it's all very high quality information. So no worries, and thank you very much for that. Um, it's really nice sure. to hear about not just about like what the FLC did, but also sort of how you you know how you operated and what you guys learned and. Um, and these books look great. So thank you so much. So if we could all give Jerry some applause, some virtual applause, and a thumbs up. Um, we'll now move to um, adapting open, adopting open resources for improved student learning with Tiffany. Hi, thank you. Oh. Um, Oh, sorry, Tiffany, hold on for one second. I just saw a hand up. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Um, Bellingham Tech, um, did you guys have a question? Oh, no, sorry. OK, no worries, no worries. All right, I'm like hypersensitive today. Like, what's happening? <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Tiffany. All right, ready? Oh, uh, whenever you're ready. Hi, thank you. Yes, I'm Tiffany Craft, and I teach within the English department at Clark College down here in Vancouver. Um, and for the faculty learning community um, that I participated in, um, we talked about adopting open resources, open educational resources, in particular to improve, improve student learning and defray costs. Um, of course, I was all over that, and I had been doing OER to a certain extent um, prior to this, but I'd always had companion text. So it resulted in a lot of reading material um, that probably overwhelmed students. And I just wanted to pare it down. So the goals of our FLC, um, we engaged five faculty members in adopting OER and restructuring their curricula, in particular their Canvas courses, to inco incorporate OER into one of the courses, um, and ideally, and we were indeed comprised of faculty from across the disciplines, and it was a, a real good um, chance for me to connect um, as affiliate adjunct faculty. I do, even though this FLC was topic-based, I do feel isolated at times, and this uh, allowed me to meet with colleagues um, and to be a part of something um, that, that was really progressive on our campus that I don't always get a chance to do. So I was very um, fortunate and appreciative of the opportunity. Um, so ultimately, we we gathered together to save students on textbooks and then to revitalize the course curricula with current and relevant learning materials. Um, so I like to think of this process, uh, the adoption of OER, as a pedagogy of progress, one that um, is ongoing and uh, certainly not static. Um, so um, in designing multiple means of measuring and multiple modes of conveying knowledge and learning, um, I wanted to keep the best practices in, of universal design in mind. Now, this is universal design is distinct from ADA um, in that ADA, of course, is, is physical and practical applications for persons with disabilities. But universal design, when you get to the page, when you get to the screen, the content, um, I, I wish more instructors would keep UD in mind because uh, students that can't access the materials often have to go through a lengthy process to remediate. 
Um, and we had a great, great instructional session our, with our last meeting. Um, John Pilate, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced his name, but he is um, our assistive tech and IT accessibility specialist here at Clark, and he is just fabulous. He's a fountain of knowledge, and um, I just gained so much from from his his talk and, and presentation. So I'm really um, amped up and stoked to make sure all of my course shells now um, utilize UD because I, I want it to be accessible for all. Um, that's a main goal of mine now. Um, another goal of mine is to introduce students and colleagues as well to vetted interdisciplinary OER. So in this process, I have gone outside of my discipline and found some of the best writing materials ever. Um, not surprisingly either. I think we some, sometimes get entrenched in th ways of thinking and doing, um, and then we blossom out into other disciplines. It, it, it just it really makes more sense and enhances our own methods. Um, I'll, I'll talk about one of those sources in a little bit when I get to a list of the ones I, I found. Um, another goal of mine is to foster digital and traditional literacy. So a lot of people get scared when we're talking about banning books of any sort, and rightly so. I, I, I'm a bibliophile myself, um, but also we do need to see the progression that the digital humanities are making and the potential for archiving um, sources. Uh, even the Vatican's archiving sources right now as we speak is something I saw on Twitter this morning. Um, so it has to happen, and we should embrace change, but yet still honor tradition. Um, so that critical thinking and creative discovery is a big component of this. And ultimately, then I'd like to encourage fellow faculty uh, campus-wide to adopt OER. And I don't know how successful I'm going to be, but um, at least to get plant the seeds and, and sh you know, show, show them some of the things that I've done and share what I've done. And yeah, take it or leave it, that's up to them, of course. That's, that's part of academic uh, liberty, right? Freedom. So here is a select list of OER, and I, I pared this down. The way I do it is I embed reading materials into my syllabus and into the modules. I like students to navigate, um, and this this is something I also learned from Kathy Chatfield here at Clark, who's wonderful, and set me up in this studio recording lab today. I'm feeling like a rock star, um, but she she helped me realize that you don't just want to funnel students to one place. You want them to navigate your site. And this is something that I do in my blogs, too. You try and create a bit of a, a Las Vegas hotel effect, where you want to keep them at the buffet and at the, the gaming tables and this and that. But occasionally, um, you know, so all the resources are there. They will be going outside, but they still always come back to you as the source of all, all of this. Um, Creative Commons, because I talk a lot in research writing, English 102 is a research writing course. I'm sure we all know that. Um, so we talk some about copyright and fair use of materials, of course, and citing. Um, writing Commons is a wonderful site um, by Joe Moxley, and it is a whole open text of, of crowdsourced writing uh, and research um, sources. It's fabulous. So that's my main text now that replaced, say, the Diana Hacker rules for writers. Um, and hybrid pedagogy, two of my heroes founded this, Jesse Stummel and Sean Michael Morris, and they are a digital journal of learning, teaching, and technology that uh, just so, so progressive. Um, they're constantly pushing the boundaries and supporting things that I think are really uh, you know, positive, so um, I use them a lot. Brain Pickings, Maria Popova's site, she is a curator of all things good and, and, and beautiful um, in the humanities, so I use her as Sunday reading. Now, that might seem cruel to give my students Sunday reading and announcements, but I often find that they like that and they give me a lot of feedback and I think it's good to get into the habit and the practice of reading as when we are researchers. So Maria Popova does a lot of that heavy lifting for me on a Sunday, on my day off. 
Um, the critical thinking web, Joe Lau of the University of Hong Kong, this is a fabulous interactive critical thinking web site um, where you can download all sorts of fun quizzes. Um, it's just really, really cool. Love Joe Lau's site. Irish tutorials, of course, let's not forget our library and the compendium of sources that are offered. YouTube, um, love it. Use it all the time. TED Ed, of course. Um, the UNC Writing Center, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, they have fabulous handouts that are, again, interdisciplinary. I use them quite often. Although Purdue's OWL, um, you know, when you Google OWL, the, before the furry little bird comes up, you'll get Purdue's online writing lab. That's how huge they are. They're just massive in scale. But honestly, I like UNC a little bit more for some things. U.S. Department of Education, great source as well. And then here at Clark, I um, found also Dr. Gerard Smith's uh, site that he link, we, is linked um, from our English department site, and he's got a great list of sources built in here as well. So I like to nod to him. Now, I was telling you about hybrid pedagogy and my um, hero, Jesse Stummel, and he wrote an article called The Student 2.0, um, and he thinks that this this education must not the way we present sources and education to our students must evolve and revolt. And it sounds almost too progressive at times. Uh, you know, we don't want a, a revolution or a rebellious students by any means, but we do want students who are curiously tapping new ways of thinking. And so that's what he means by this. And here is a quote from Jesse. The student 2.0 is an altogether different animal from the student 1.0, and our classrooms are ecosystems, an environment all their own, where each must decide how to engage this new species of students. And we must engage students' um, curiosity, I think. And, um, you know, they've, they've grown up in a digital world where they're, they're used to testing ideas, and that doesn't mean that we forego tradition. We definitely don't, but we, we certainly need to stimulate their curiosity and trust them as well. So we're not just disseminating information, we're, we're learning and curating together. Um, I love this uh, screenshot of the balanced rocks here, and I got this off of a TED talk from Amy Tan, Where Does Creativity Lie? And so I just, you know, put a screenshot on there because I thought it was a perfect way of measuring the idea of balancing costs here and how difficult it actually is to do. Um, but it can be done if you're patient enough. So um, an English professor should not dabble in math, but I've done it anyway. That's why we have approximates here, <laughs> notice. Um, so that is the collective savings per term here. So for example, fall term, um, I will have three classes, so 25 students per course times three. Um, and per English 102 course, there are typically two required textbooks, each costing around $40. And that's a, a good guesstimate, even when you balance the used textbook prices. So individual student savings per term are 80, is 80, and then the collective um, per term is 6,000. So collectively, that's a lot. Individually, it doesn't sound like a lot, but when you when you don't have $80 to begin with and you're squeezing it out of your budget, it, it's something. Um, another thing I like about OER is the agency. Um, you know, it's on 24-7 by a canvas and then digital OER. All you need is Wi-Fi, of course. Um, the materials are accessible and asynchronous. We do have some scheduled synchronous meetings that, that we have, such as this Collaborate is. Um, but often, of course, students who are working and their parents and their students, asynchronous is a, a wonderful opportunity. And there's also the Portable Canvas app. Um, um, you can't do everything there, but it's, there's no excuse, really. You can always access the material. Um, what do my students say? Well, I ask them. Um, on Tuesdays at 8 a.m. when class starts, I ask the 20 students the following. After using OER for seven weeks now, I'm actually already using this in my 102 courses, 
are you for or against it? And take in mind, I ask them questions at 8 a.m. and I usually don't get much back. But overwhelmingly, they actually all said four in unison. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Not only are you guys are awake, you're enthusiastic about this. That got me excited. Um, so I then followed up and I asked them about OER course availability. So if, if given the choice, would you take a traditional or OER course offering? And again, overwhelmingly, OER. And I mean, this seriously was in unison, um, as if they'd rehearsed it. And they had no idea I was going to pull them. Um, and then one student raised her hand and said, saving $80 per course means I can send my daughter to ballet lessons or take my family out to a nice meal. Um, so that sort of culture and community that can be fostered just with 80 bucks shaved off means so much to me. It makes this whole thing worth it. So what if? What if students were given the choice between traditional and OER course offerings across the disciplines? Um, now, don't all run in panic to face-to-face -face instructors. This is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but my hypothesis is that more students would opt for OER, and this in turn might increase enrollment and retention college-wide. Um, and then if you apply universal design to your courses, too, it, it, they just become so much more rich and robust. Um, and I don't think there's anything that we should be scared of with this change. It's, it's not, you know, eliminating books from our lives. It's, it's enriching the materials that we have access to. So speaking of that, of course, there are materials all over the web and in research writing um, you know, there are best practices for vetting sources, but I think this should be a main practice. And we talked a little bit about this um, at the ATL conference in our Ignite session. And we've talked about this in particular in, in, in the OER FLC here at Clark about ways of going about vetting those sources and then, and then delivering that um, to our chairs um, and so on. So if we did convert traditional course courses, um, it's a progressive option that institutions worldwide engage in. Um, this isn't anything groundbreaking, really. It's, it's time, time to be done. Um, and it is a competitive market. So to compete, I think we have to intuit, meet, and exceed a variety of student demands and learning styles. Um, in line with the mission to reduce costs, we should vet OER according to best practices, just like we tell them, tell students to, you know, scrutinize databases for credibility, currency, reliability, et cetera, stability. Um, and, and these things can all be, all be done. And of course, the individual instructor has, you know, it on them to go back and make sure all of these links are always stable. Um, like, you know, that sort of thing, but it's not too much to ask because we do this all the time with text, new textbook adoptions and hard copy too, right? Um, page numbers change, things get deleted. It it's, can be quite a racket. Um, so adoptions, writing comments, and this is Joe Moxley's baby, um, reports that they are averaging approximately 5,000 users a day and some pretty uh, you know, major universities here have adopted their text. Duke University's composition MOOC, so of course the massive open online courses, um, no surprise there, you're not going to get 20,000 students probably to purchase a textbook for free um, uh, enrollment in a course, but um, still, it, it, this is such quality material. I hope everyone visits Writing Commons. Um, there you go, on down the list there. Um, I love books, right? This is my personal collection of the Yellow Book, which is a periodical that was published in 13 volumes from 1894 to 1897. During its uh, period of publication, it caused all sorts of uh, fear and panic across the community of, of London in particular because it was so avant-garde. Um, it was yellow, that, that, that scary color. It meant radical progress, um, text next to image. Um, it was outrageous. Um, it was going to change the way lending libraries um, could disseminate text, right? People could actually purchase all of these things in, in one thing, an art book, right? So it was thought to be really crazy, plus um, loosely affiliated with Oscar Wilde, although he never made a contribution. But anyway, it was it was scary. And any advancement, if you think about it, in technology and, and the book industry and the way we consume ideas in, in print um, 
I mean, my gosh, think of the outrage when the typewriter came into our homes or the telephone. So um, as a Victorian scholar, I would like to, you know, take my horse and buggy to school, but I have to take a Mini Cooper. You know, times are a-changing. So here we are now, and the reason I have this big block of text is because we do feel bombarded, and this term digital distraction ha has been demythologized to a certain degree because there are also studies that show that we can be many places, at opening multiple windows um, on multiple devices, much like a stockbroker would, and still be effective and impactful and focused. But it does take practice, so this will be overwhelming perhaps uh, for some, but um, when we when we get those Google glasses someday, we'll all be walking around in augmented reality states, and I think it'll be uh, refreshing to, to to then step out and go into the countryside and have a picnic. But nonetheless, this is a way that we can really work forward um, and communicate on multiple levels. I have my students add me on Twitter, where I pass around articles. Um, I also link to one of my blogs when we're testing ideas about food because food ignites passion in writing and culture and connectivity. Um, but breathe. Now here's one of my favorite heroes as well, Paulo Freire ped from Pedagogy of the Oppressed. The oppressed having internalized the message, or sorry, the image of the oppressor and adopted his guidelines are fearful of freedom. Freedom would require them to eject this image and replace it with autonomy and responsibility. And I am talking about the responsibility um, of, of remediating texts into your courses through OER. And, um, and it takes a little bit of work, but it, it's driven all by curiosity and, and, you know, good cause, right? So, so this has become such a fun project for me that I really believe in. And I honestly do find the textbook industry oppressive, and I'm sorry if that offends anyone. Um, but, and, and this is in, true with any sort of anthologized text. There's always those, those key or, or um, you know, writers that were, that have been since resuscitated that, that lie lifeless there. Their ideas, if they're secondary, if they're not the canonical greats, they're not always included. So I particularly like the idea of sourcing what you need. Oh, and I had a video. Uh, let me see if I can do this. And I can invite you to follow me, I guess. Is that how this works? We just wait. We, we just wait for the web tour to begin. <laughs> OK. Um, this is one of my favorites. It's based on Plato's uh, dialogue, The Republic. And it comes from you know book seven, of course, which is the allegory of the cave. Um, and I don't want to overanalyze it for you. I'm sure many of us have already heard about it. But um, let's see if it even comes up. Hit return. Oh, God, sorry. It would help if I follow the directions. There we go. Imagine prisoners that have spent their entire lives chained deep inside a cave. They have been chained so that they cannot see behind themselves. And they are forced to stare endlessly at the cave wall in front of them. Behind them, a fire is burning. And between the prisoners and the fire is a raised walkway. Now imagine that each day a menagerie of objects crosses the walkway. Animals. People carrying their wares to market. Their shapes create an intricate shadow play on the wall in front of the prisoners. This is the only world that the prisoners have ever known. The shadows and the echoes of unseen objects. Now, imagine that the prisoner is released. After some time adjusting to the blinding light,
Wow, Tiffany. <laughs> I've never seen that claymation before. Um, that's very powerful. Um, I think you have one more slide. I know it's a thank you slide, but um, do you have anything else that you want to add to that? It's, that was pretty stunning. <laughs> Tiffany, yeah, if you press your talk button again, you should be able to come on the mic again. There we go. Thank you. Yes, thank you. That's it. I'm happy to have you all here listening and looking. This is great. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Tiffany, um, do you mind posting the URL in the chat window? Mm -hmm. um, Greg said his sound uh, wasn't working, and so I think he'd like to watch it. And. Uh, oh, yeah. I wish I had had that when I was teaching. Um, it's certainly, I, you know, I know that the focus of this is OER, but I'm just <laughs> sort of like reeling from the allegory of the cave made real in that way. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Woo. That's, laughs> I know. I hope it wasn't too uh, provocative. <laughs> I'm, not, oh. I'm not suggesting we're all prisoners if we have textbooks, but there is the other side, you know? <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh, no, no, I, I thought it was very appropriate, but I'm just, you know, like, you know, I, I really try to practice my imagination about texts, and, right. but that was definitely, I've never been able to make my imagination do that. Like, I think the allegory of the cave was almost sanitized for me in a way, um, oh, right. probably due to my, my lack of intellectual prowess. And so that was, <laughs> I'm still reeling. I wish I had had that when I was teaching. <laughs> <laughs> I use it all the time. I, I have to. <laughs> it's powerful. Thank you. So, do people have questions for Jerry or for Tiffany? Um, I don't. I, I didn't mean to dominate the discussion there. And go ahead and just type your questions in, or if you have a mic, go ahead and speak them. So it looks like um, it looks like we don't have any questions yet, and I think I would just like to ask a question. Um, both of you are, you know, I mean, service learning isn't maybe as um, I, I don't even think it's, OER is not necessarily controversial, but I do think when faculty try to implement large scale change on this level with you know things that we know are good for students and we know are good for faculty, but require a lot of collaboration, they um, you know, especially if you're trying to get a department to agree to a textbook or, you know, somebody to agree to, you know, just taking students off campus, for example. Did, did having a group of faculty mentoring each other help you negotiate anything that, any obstacles that may have come in your way? Um, hi, yeah, for us, I think that some instructors are still reluctant to part with the textbook and they weren't sure if adopting OER meant that they had to, say, write their own open text like Joe Moxley has done with writing comments. Um, so it was a learning, there, there is a learning curve there um, and they realized it might not be, happening right away. It will take a period of time and slow hybrid adoptions along the way. Um, so, but it, on many levels it brought us close together and we could at least, you know, c compare some of the sources that we were having and the community was definitely established. Um, and we even met outside of the community, which was great. So, for me, you know, it, it was a great experience. That's very cool and I imagine too as you as you move on, these relationships that you forged will be valuable networks as you negotiate other challenges. Definitely. So it looks like Greg is typing. Um, oh, here we go. The Oregon group had a great OER presentation mini conference with Cable Green. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, Cable Green 
Yes, it worked here at the State Board um, for many years, and he is still one of our go-to minds when it comes to OER. He's very um, compelling, um, and he has a lot of, I, I like Cable's um, explorations of things other than OER as well, you know, about um, government documents and things like that. It's great. Yeah, he's, he's very powerful and very charismatic. Thanks, Greg. Okay, well, it's almost, it's 2.57, so um, I'm really liking um, Tiffany's image here of a car driving down the road at sunset. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone, for coming today, and thank you, Jerry and Tiffany, for your wonderful presentations. And I will be posting um, the links. Oh, Earl, did you have a, a question or a comment? Um, Earl, I see your hand up. Go right ahead. You just touched on it. Uh, I was wanting the oh. um, the English specific uh, OER resources that were posted. Yes, I um, I was out of the office this week and half of last week, and so I haven't had time to update the <laughs> ATL blog. But and so I apologize for that. But actually, I'll just very quickly. Um, here, I'll show you where it will be. Um, actually, I want this. OK, there we go. So this should just take a second. Um, can you guys see the blog? Yes. yes. Oh, great. OK, perfect. So you'll see I've created a, um, a special link for our webinar series. And I have the Collaborate recordings here. And this, right now, this page is not very beautifully formatted. <laughs> and so I will be, um, uh, I'm going to take you to it. We have a different, we have just a, a regular, just, you know, sort of like webinars based on faculty interest. And you'll see I've got little pictures with their, with the Collaborate recording, the handouts, the slide deck, and a short survey. So I will be, um, and the, the formatting's a little bit messed up on this page, but as you can see, it's a little bit cleaner. And so I will be spending some time next week um, reformatting <laughs> this page. So it looks more like that page. <laughs> so it'll have all the um, all the handouts, every, every, all the resources. Oh wait, and Greg just said no. I could, Greg, you could. Sorry, Greg, you couldn't see that. I, I apologize. Um, so I will be up. Oh, okay. Assessment learning teaching.com. So I will be uploading um, those links. I will be, uh, sorry, yes, I'll be uploading everything and just making it a lot cleaner and a lot more uh, user-centered. Um, Earl, uh, did you have another question? No, nope. thank you very much. Oh. That was okay. awesome. Yeah, we are very lucky. Um, this is, I think, one of the coolest things about the faculty learning communities is the work that gets done in when faculty partner with other faculty and student services and administrators to really uh, partner in the name of student learning. And we, they really do produce rich content. So I'm very excited to share it with the system. Um, thanks again, Tiffany. Thanks again. Uh, Jerry for presenting, and thank you to our participants. And Alyssa just put the survey link um, in the chat window, and so if you could go to that chat window, or if you could go to that link and fill out a survey um, and let us know what we could, what worked for you and what we could do better, that would be great. Thanks, everyone. Alyssa, Amber, thank you for um, your attendance today, and uh, we're lucky. All right, everyone. Have a great day.